G'day and welcome back to RC Model Reviews for probably one of the most important videos this year because I'm going to be talking about digital FPV. Now it's it's come of age, it's come of age. I've had the DJI system, in fact I've had two DJI digital systems for quite a while now. I fly them, I wouldn't say regularly, I fly them occasionally. I also have the HD Zero system, known, formerly known as SharkBite, and I fly that occasionally, not regularly. And of course I have analog as well. Now see, this is the HD Zero with Fat Shark goggles. This is where most people use the system, the receiver on the front here, the, the omnidirectional antennas, two built-in patch antennas, plugs into the, uh, the goggles through the HDMI port underneath here. That's a system that a lot of people are sw switching to at the moment because it has turned out they've had a special offer. It's been cheap. $99 I think for the add-on receiver for your goggles and the video transmitters are also quite affordable. Quite affordable. It has some benefits. Now of course as I say the other option is the DJI digital system. You can look like a bug if you want to. This has its own set of special features. It's, it's different. It's different in a number of ways and I'm going to explain that today from a technical and a user perspective. Um, so a lot of people have got into DJI and of course they like that as well. But it'll probably surprise many of you, perhaps those who don't regularly read my postings, to discover that I probably fly 90% of the time with analog. Yeah, good old fashioned analog is what I choose to use most of the time. There's a reason for that too and I'll tell you about that in a separate video because that's not something for today. Today I'm going to take some extreme liberties because I'm going to explain to you in hopefully think terms you understand using you know not too much technical stuff but enough technical stuff to get the message across. I'm going to explain what the difference is between this and this from a, from a technical perspective. I'm going to make you into a geek. I'm going to tell you all about the bits, bytes, RF and things that, that make this different to this and why sometimes this is the best and why other times this is the best. So this, is nev this was never going to be as simple as saying if you're going digital, buy this. You know, there's, there's no clear winner here. There is no clear winner between DJI and SharkBite or HD0 as it's now called. So I'm going to walk you through the technical differences tell you how those technical differences produce or technical differences produce different performance in certain areas and then you can look at this from the point of view of knowing how these work make it much easier for you to decide which one is going to be best for you because that's all that matters you shouldn't care been about what's best for me it's about what's best for you and I, and so this all the reviews you see saying oh this is great or that's great yeah I don't think it's fair to make those reviews in the digital era because the differences are quite different and dramatic. And if you just watch somebody who says, oh, this is fantastic, buy this, link in the description, affiliate, ching ching, um, I don't think that's the best way to make the decision. In fact, I think it's probably the worst way to make the decision. You have to know how they work to understand what they're going to do for you. And that's the purpose of this video. Now I've got my digital whiteboard because my regular whiteboard is stuffed that doesn't un un erase doesn't erase anymore it's terrible it was cheap when I bought it and it's just useless now I should get a ceramic one but I can't afford it so I'm using a digital whiteboard hopefully that will suffice for this uh, this discussion I've already done a video for those who want to know and I'll probably put the link up here somewhere if I remember about how analog video works this is going to be similar to the video that talked about how analog works from a technical perspective but it's going to talk about how the HD0 system works and it's going to talk about how the DJI digital system works. As I say I will be taking some liberties here because if I went into the deep dive technical stuff you'd all glaze over and go and start drinking and I don't know what you'd do but you wouldn't watch it because it would be too damn boring because it would be whoosh, over the top of most people's heads. So I've simplified things. I've used um, analogs. I've used not, analog's not a good word. I've used equivalents and I've used taken some liberties with the technically precise facts. Also, one of the problems I have is that I don't have access to all the technical details on these systems. Uh, nobody knows exactly, outside of DJI, how these damn things work. Because they don't tell you. And likewise, um, although there's some data sheets for the technology in the HD0, I've had to join some dots. I may have joined them incorrectly. I'm pretty sure HD0, or well, Carl from HD0, will contact me and tell me I've got it wrong, if I've got it wrong. And in which case, I'll do a follow-up and correct any major errors that I may be making in this video. But it's all I can do. So right, grab yourself a coffee, maybe two, or if you have something else you prefer to drink, grab that, 
put your feet up, put this on the big TV in the living room because it's going to be a long one, folks. You'll be here for a while. But let's get on with it. Let's look at how these things work. Okay, let's start by looking at the HD0 system. It's driven by a DiviMath chip, and it's the DM5680. Now, there's some interesting claims made for the system, but basically there's, a, there's some brochures online. You can see it says it's a wireless HD video transceiver IC with near zero latency, and using a pair of these chips, you can get unparalleled, robust video audio data links secure from ear to ground. And interesting point to note here is the DM5680 Zero, the, the chip used by HD0 transmits raw video instead of compressed video. That's important to remember because that's one of the, it's both its strengths and its weaknesses summed up basically there. Uh, it says it can reach less than one millisecond latency. That's not glass to glass, that's just from chip to chip. Um, it has uh, excellent capability of anti interference, low power consumption, and a smaller footprint make this chip the perfect solution for FPV applications. It also says it works seamlessly with the AD936X. And uh, so, yeah, so they basically, that's it. This is part of that thing. I think I have another, another one of those here, another part of that brochure here. Here we go. Again, it says near zero latency. And um, what have we got? A smart denoise. They talk about the smart denoise. And I'm going to look at another shot here, which is, again, from promotional stuff. Here's... An example of what they're talking about, it says the HD0 smart denoise capability provides robust video link and stable data stream from air unit to ground in a very low signal to noise ratio condition. Um, snowflake artifacts are displayed instead of traditional blackout as other digital systems behave. So what they're basically saying is you, you'll get snow, you get this, this speckly breakup. And indeed, that is, that is what happens. You do get the speckled breakup with the HD0 system. It also says long range in line of sight uh, 1.24 miles and the speed of 93 miles an hour. Ex excellent transmission quality is maintained. And again, this um, the video systems are quite different, and you can see that when you're using them. But uh, the reason for that we'll cover when we compare this system to the DJI Digital. Now, this is the block diagram for using this 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 HD0 chip. Basically, you have a, a header here goes off to your camera, and you've got your magic chip here with the secret source and then they have this device called an 89361 that is the rf goodness side of things this is where most of the rf goodness happens and that's connected to a uh, power amplifier here via a low noise uh, amplifier and goes out to your antenna so there's the, the power amplifier we'll see where that fits into the thing later on but this 89361 chip is a very interesting one let's take a look at the data sheet for that this is the 89361 it's called an RF Agile Transceiver. So it does, as I say, does RF goodness, and it covers a very wide range of frequencies. It's all, you know, pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, so this is where the receiving and basic transmitting takes place through this device. The thing I found most interesting about this is that it is specified as part of the system. And if we go and have a look at what these things cost, you'd probably be scratching your head like I am. So here's the DigiKey page for the 89361, and look at the price down here. It is nearly $300, unit price $300, and that's one-off quantities. If you're buying in a reel, normally, well, you normally buy in a reel of 1500. These things are tiny little chips. They come on a reel. So if you're going to buy a whole reel of 1500 chips, that's $433,000, and initially I thought, hey, <clears throat> this is probably because... Um, it's fairly well known that DigiKey can be a bit expensive sometimes. It's more designed for people buying smaller quantities than, than production quantities, but 300 bucks. So I thought, let's have a look at Mouser, see what their price is. And over at Mouser here, we have a look. They're even worse. Look, the price from Mouser is 314 or $315, which means if you want to buy a reel of these things, it's nearly half a million dollars. And also, long lead time, as with everything. 53 week lead time on these things. I must say, I looked at this device, this 89361, when I was looking at doing an HD video system myself, and I was put off by the pricing. I figured, no way, you can't make a video transmitter if it's going to cost you $315 for just one of the chips. No one's going to use that. No one's going to build that. No one's going to buy that. But for some reason, I don't know how, HD0 has managed to get these chips at obviously a much lower price, or they're making a huge loss on every unit. I don't know which, but um, yeah, or well, maybe they've changed the chip they're using now. It does have a different marking on it in some of the later ones. I think they may have rebranded that chip, um, had it a 
custom marking on it so that it, uh, this anomaly doesn't stand out. I don't know. Don't really know the story there. Perhaps Carl can um, bring us up to date on that if he's watching this video. But now let's look at the the block diagram for the HD0 system. Well, as I said, this is the this is the block diagram. You've got camera, you've got the secret source with video processing, you've got the RF goodness, and then you've got a power amplifier on the end. Um, and I will be drawing that out again in just a moment. But this chip here, the, the DM5680, this is where all the magic happens. It's the secret source. Let's take a look at what HD0 tell us about what's inside this chip. And here's the DiviMath datasheet for this chip. Basically, they're saying it's a wireless video transmitter, no compression needed. Well, there's no compression provided. I don't know whether that's the same thing or not. Less than a millisecond's latency, up to 1080p, 30 frames a second, several different uh, video interfaces, audio interface. This has got some UARTs, GPIO. It's got a built-in OSD, radio frequency coverage from 340 megahertz to 5.8 gigahertz. Of course, we're using 5.8 for these things. Um, small footprint, it's a 10 millimeter QFN package, low power, typically 200 milliwatts, and application for first person view and unmanned aerial vehicle operations. And here's what's inside the processor. This is the, the, the magic source, as I say, the, the uh, HD0 system. They have a video processor, and there's not much, they don't say much about what this video processor does, but we're going to talk about that in a moment when I do my own diagram. They have an OFDM transmitter, which is a modulator, basically lays the video information on top of a carrier wave. And then they have an OFDM receiver, that's the demodulator, it reverses the process. Um, there's OSD circuitry in there, there's a radio IF here, which creates output that goes off to that other very expensive chip that we, uh, that we talked about earlier. Um, so this is basically what's inside the secret source chip for the HD0 system. Now, um, what I'm going to do now is just draw my own diagram of how this works, and, and you'll be able to see it's, it's a very simple system. Okay, this is where it all starts getting rough because my drawing skills are atrocious, but let's see what we can do explaining how the HD0 digital FPV system works. Remembering I'm joining some dots here, I may draw some incon incorrect conclusions, but I'm working with what I've got in terms of information. Let's start with a camera. All FPV systems start with a camera. This clicks the, the image and it connects to another functional block here, which HD0 call their video processing. And that connects, unlike analog, is not just one line carrying the data. We've got multiple lines because we've got a lot more data, a lot more data being transferred. Remember, this is HD, so there's much more information coming from this camera than a regular SD analog camera. And this is sometimes a MIPI bus. Uh -oh, this connects basically the camera to the video processor. The video processor then outputs some stuff, which goes over here to something which is OFD. M, which is orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. That's a complicated word. You don't have to worry about that just for the moment. Um, and then the output of that goes over here to an RF amplifier. And this is an RF power amplifier, a PA. And that has an output which goes off to the video transmitters antenna. So everything, basically everything above this line is VTX and everything below this line is VRX in this drawing. So there we go. Now we need to talk a bit about what these blocks do. As I say, this is coming out of here, coming out of the camera is just a whole lot of ones and zeros, one zero, one zero, one zero, dot, 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 forever. For as long as that camera's powered up, it's spewing out bits. And those bits are just a stream of binary data. It's called a binary data stream. That comes out of here, goes into the video processor. Now we have to sort of work out what the video processor is doing, but one thing it is doing is it is packetizing this data. What does that mean? Well, let's, let's assume we have a sequence of 101100111001001. This is the stream, right? This goes on forever. What a packetizer does is it takes chunks of that stream. So let's say it takes four bits at a time. It takes that four bits and it'll take those four bits and those four bits and it breaks them up into blocks. And for each block of four bits, it first of all starts by putting a packet number which is packet number on the front. That's the packet number. Then the data goes in here, transfers this data down to here. And then at the end, there is a thing which is a, an error check or correcting code, it's often called CRC if they're using a CRC code. So this is where the data lives. And each of these packets is treated accordingly. So we end up with a, stream, a packet stream. So this is a bit stream. And here we have a packet stream. 
Oh, you can't even read this, can you? Never mind. If you're on a phone, too bad. Um, but what we have done here basically is we have wrapped up the data, chopped it up into small blocks, wrapped it up. So this is done for a number of reasons. Now, we know that when we transmit this through the ether, some of the data will be lost. There'll be interference, there'll be multi-pathing, all sorts of things will cause some of the data to be lost. And if we just had a data stream here, for example, imagine if we lost... Um, this bit, say this bit just didn't arrive, then what would happen is this would be considered bit one, bit two, bit three, and instead of this being bit five, it becomes bit four. So suddenly all the rest of the stuff is out of sync and there's no way to synchronize it up again. We don't know, if we first start, we don't know we've lost a bit or had a bit corrupted and then we don't know how to recover from that because we've just got a continuous stream. There's no checks and balances. When we packetize data like this, we each packet has a number. So we know if we, lose, we lost a whole packet, we would know because instead of getting packets in the order one, two, three, four, five, we might get one, two, three, five. We know, oh, packet four is missing. Oh, goodness me. And so we can, instead of treating the next packet as packet four, we'll treat it as five because it's been labeled as five. Also, if, if some data inside the packet, if the actual bits inside the packet are, are damaged, then the CRC code here will not match. And so we will then know this data is invalid. We shouldn't use it. And uh, we should just move on to the next packet. That's how packetizing works. It's, it's a layer of, of protection for the data. And that's really important because it means that we can get a nice crisp clear signal. If we know we've got bad data, we can ignore it or we can do other clever tricks to, to cover up the fact that the data is missing. And so that's why we make a packet stream. That's one of the key functions of all digital systems generally use packets instead of a raw binary data stream because it provides that protection against losing data or losing synchronization and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, so here we have a packet stream. So we have a stream not of bits and bytes, but a stream of packets. Each packet can be handled independently and is checked and is numbered. That packet stream goes into the OFDM. Now, OFDM is interesting. Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiplexing. It is a way... Um, in fact, I'll show you. Here's a separate little segment. We'll talk about OFDM. Right, let's talk about orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, which is a really complicated term. Basically, just means putting some binary or some digital information onto a radio frequency signal. But first, let's, let's look at how analog works, right? Let's go back to the analog. I've done a video on this, as I say. Let's assume that this is the amplitude of a signal. So as you go up, it's a stronger signal. And this is the frequency this way. So let's say we've got 5.8 gigahertz just here. 5.8 gigahertz. Okay. The way analog works is that if you just had it on no modulation, you'd have this a line here, a line. This is the line at 5.8 gigahertz where you've got what we call a carry wave. It's just pure radio frequency. There's no information on that. It's just plain unadulterated, unadulterated radio frequency. Now, in the case of an analog system, you have a voltage like this that comes out of the camera. And that voltage is superimposed on this carrier by varying its frequency. So if we if we look at the, here's the pure carrier wave, the pure sine wave with no information. If we modulate or superimpose this, this video voltage onto that, then it varies its frequency. So as the voltage goes up, the frequency also goes up. So these waves are closer together and then they get further apart, the frequency drops, and then they go up and down again. So the, the, the spacing of the waves, the frequency is dependent on the voltage that you're modulating it with. And what you can see from there, obviously, if you apply a voltage that lowers the frequency of the RF, then this line will move over here to a lower frequency. And if you apply a voltage that raises the frequency by putting these closer together, then the carrier will move over here. So this carrier is going to be in any of the positions between down here somewhere and up there. And generally, if you look at it on an oscilloscope, on a, on a frequency analyzer, um, spectrum analyzer, it'll look something like this. So you get this, this spread, the spread of information by wiggling that carrier backwards and forwards in frequency. And that is the bandwidth. Bandwidth. Yeah, I can't spell a thing. So the bandwidth it uses, I think in, in the case of... Um, Analog, it's about 8 megahertz, I think. About 8 megahertz of bandwidth. And in theory, you could carry a higher, higher definition picture by using more bandwidth, wiggling this further because you're going to you're going to have the you're going to need to move it more quickly, and so it'll need to move further to get what we call modulation index. Won't go there; it's too complicated. Um, but let's talk now. This is just regular. This is FM, very basic. It's been around for for, for eons. FM frequency modulation. Um, but let's look at OFDM. What we have there is we, we, we want to send a lot more data because standard definition, 
doesn't require a lot of data. There's not a lot of information in an SD picture. But when you go to HD, you've got more information. And more information generally, all else being equal, requires more bandwidth. You've got to fit more. You've got to fit a You've got to fit more data in here, so you need more space to do it, unless you do something really clever. Now, as I say, with the analog, you've got one carrier, and it's just wiggled about. With OFDM, they do some clever stuff. They say 5.8 um, gigahertz. There. With OFDM, what they do is they say, well, why don't we use more than one carrier? Why don't we use more than one set of RF? So there, there might be a singlet at, eight, at 5.8. There might be another one down here, and another one here. And another one here, and another one here. And unlike frequency modulation, where there's only ever one carrier and it's moved around, here we have multiple carriers, multiple sets of RF. That, and they can all be on at the same time. And they can all wiggle around a little bit. They can all wiggle a little bit backwards and forwards like this. Um, but that means is because you've got more carriers, you can fit more information. This can still just be 8 megahertz. It's actually higher, I think, with the digital systems. But you can fit a lot more data by using more carrier waves. It's it's pretty logical, isn't it? However, there has to be some pretty clever math going on here because you don't want this carrier wave standing on that one because then you don't know which is which. And there has to be a special relationship between all these carriers, which is why it's orthogonal frequency division multi uh, multiplexing. There's special math goes on here to make sure that the it's the relationship between these carriers, not actually where the carriers themselves are, but the relationships between them that encode the information. Now, there's a very good video on R.C. Shim's channel. He's used a spectrum analyzer and given a 3D plot of an OFDM signal. And you can see the individual carriers in the, the signal. It's, I'll put a link to it in the description of this video. Go and look at it by all means. And thank Mario for taking the time to make that video. But it really, really demonstrates this, this way of doing things. So here, you can imagine here we're sending one, it, it, to be, I'm sort of, uh, I'm taking some liberties here, but you can imagine you're sending one bit at a time here because you've got one carrier here. You can send like one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, maybe 16 bits at a time. You can get much more data in the same piece of bandwidth. It doesn't scale like that, but it does mean you can send more data. If you were around in the 1980s, for example, you may recall that when modems first started, computer modems, we had like 300 bits per second of transmission and 1,200 bits per second of transmission because we used a very simple system, which was basically just frequency modulation. Once we moved to a system like this, we got up to 56 k bits per uh, 56 kilobits per second, even though we were using the same amount of bandwidth because we just stacked these extra carriers here and had the, the relationships between them. It's a fantastic piece of technology. It also has the benefit that you can vary the the rate at which the data is sent and the sensitivity of things by changing the number of carriers. You can actually, the more carriers you've got, then the more data you can send, but the more likely it is that you're going to suffer from any interference that's around. If you reduce the number of carriers, you can then effectively punch through interference a bit better, although things will happen more slowly. And you'll see this trade-off, I'll mention this later on when I'm talking about the DJI system, but you can have an adaptive bit rate by varying the number of carriers. It's, it's really good. Now, the, the um, HD0 system doesn't use an adaptive bit rate. It just uses a fixed number of carriers on the on the OFDM system. But suffice to say, this is how we put um, bits of data onto an RF wave through OFDM. They give us this RF output, which is across a bandwidth, and then it's handled by the rest of the system. So it's just a clever way of squeezing data into the radio frequency. And let's go back to the HD0 system. Right, so now we've sorted that out, we have our radio frequency goodness coming out of the OFDM system, and that's then amplified by a power amplifier. So here we might typically have microwatts of power. It's just, it's just signal level. It's not designed to be broadcast. It's just designed to be um, created. So we need to amplify it up to um, as much as one watt in the case of the HD0 system. Uh, where they've got now got one watt transmitters. That's then broadcast out into space. And at the other end, down here, remember this is Video Rex, video receiver down here, we've got another matching receiver, video receiver antenna. In fact, the HD0 system has two unidirectionals and two patches. So it's got four antennas, but they, they basically just chooses the best signal as required um, that comes in. And now we have an RF amplifier. Now this is because the and because there's a whole lot of gap between the transmitter antenna and the receiver antenna, we might be broadcasting a watt here, but at this end we might just be receiving a few micro volts of signal, tiny, tiny power levels. We need to boost that up so we can work with it. So the RF amplifier here is like a, a, the preamp on your stereo. It boosts up the signal level to a useful level. Then it goes into, you guessed it, OFDM. And this, to make it clear, this is a modulator 
and this is a demodulator. So as you might guess, this does exactly the opposite of that. Whereas this superimposes the packets on a radio frequency carrier or on multiple radio frequency carriers, as we saw. Um, so we've got radio frequency down here. It basically merges this with that and gives us a, a modulated output stream. The demodulator does exactly the opposite. It subtracts the radio frequency from the incoming RF that we've amplified. And what does that leave us with? Well, it leaves us with a series of packets again. So the same packets that we sent up here magically appear down here on your goggles or in, in the receiver on your FPV system. All right. So then we go off to another box, which is VP. Again, the magic video processing. And one thing we know that this does do is it will then disassemble the packet. So it will strip out the CRC and it will strip out the packet number and it will then rebuild that as best it can. That data, that bit stream that was up here will reappear here. So in effect, at this point here, we've got exactly the same thing that we had here. Uh, where are we? Um, here. Coming into here. Right, that of course can go off to our goggles. Here's our goggles, wonderful drawing. That goes off to our goggles. In the case of the HD0, that's via HDMI. So that's it, that's how it works. It's really quite simple. There's not a lot of boxes and they all operate fairly, fairly straightforward. HD0, it's a very simple digital video system. And that's one of its benefits because it's because it's not doing a lot of work. It's very, very low latency. The bits just flow through the system. A little bit of an overhead in terms of packeting and a little bit of overhead in terms of depacketing, but that's really, really a tiny amount. So it has massive benefits by doing that um, in terms of latency. That's the real strength of HD0. Latency, uh, a low component count, relatively low power consumption because you're not doing as much heavy lifting with all the silicon. And it works. It works very well, especially for things like racing, where you really need the low latency. Um, and what else can I say about it? Well, not much. Because it's simple, you can also make much lighter, much uh, simpler video transmitters at a lower cost as well. The cost is lower because you know, apart from the, the price of this, um, this, this RF goodness chip, which, as I say, $300, seriously. Um, the, but they've overcome that in some way. But this means you can build 1S Tiny Whoop HD video systems. Hey ho, who, who would have thought? But that's the HD0 system. Um, technically speaking, that's how it works as far as I can deduce from the data sheets and from what I've seen by analyzing its operation. Very simple, very straightforward, and it works. What more could you wish for? Well, let's have a look at DJI and see how they've done this because trust me, it's a lot more complicated. Right, let's take a look at the DJI system. Let's have our camera because, as I say, that's where all FPV starts is with a camera. There's the camera from the DJI digital system. And it comes out, again, multiple data lines because it's digital. It goes into a box here. And this is not video processing. This is a frame buffer. What does that mean? Well, the HD0 system treats this data as a data stream. It just it doesn't change it. It just packetizes it up and sends it out. That's all it does. So it's very quick. It's very fast. It's very simple. Um, and so you get low latency. Fantastic. What the DJI system does is it actually sort of effectively builds up a copy of the camera screen in its own memory. So it gets a frame of the image. And that enables you to do some very powerful stuff later on. Because the next phase here is a box, which I'll call comp which is video compressor, we'll put VCOMP, video compressor. So what this does is at this point, we still have 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, um, being able to go backwards and or being able to go from the frame buffer to the compressor. But because we have a whole screen, a whole image, we can actually apply some really, really impressive compression to the image. We can compare one piece of the screen to another piece of the screen. And if there's a relationship, we can send the data that relates the two rather than having to send every single pixel of that screen as a bit we can send some information that says, well, this bit's the same as that bit, so we'll send that bit once and just say that other bit's the same. The, the compression, this is stuff we've seen already. If you've ever used a camera and you get a JPEG image, or you've used, you know, use a, any video, any um, photo editing software, you can compress it pictures down quite dramatically by using compression like JPEG. Um, what that does is exactly the same thing. It takes, it doesn't tell you what all the pixels are. It, it creates some 
small losses, but it enables you to squeeze a lot of data down. You can take a still image, which might be several megabytes, compress it down to just a few tens of kilobytes by using things like JPEG. Um, and in video, we do the same thing. We have some codecs called H.264 and H.265. And what they do is they do even cleverer stuff because they compare one frame with the previous frame. Now, don't think that DJI is using something like that. I think it's a frame by frame compression, but I, I can't be sure because they don't tell us. But it does allow the video compression to remove a lot of redundant information. For example, you've got a blue sky. Well, the whole sky is blue. On a perfectly good day, the whole sky is blue. You only need to say this area is blue. You don't need to say this pixel's blue and this one's blue and this one's blue. You can do a, a, just a somewhat more generic thing and say that the whole area over here is blue. You send the color, you send the area bounds, and that's it. You have to spend, send a lot less data. So this enables the DJI system to put a quart into a pint pot. The data coming out of here may be measured in megabytes per frame. And the data coming out of here may be kbytes per frame. So it's, it's now got much less data to deal with. Much less data to deal with. Um, and as with the HD0 system, it then has a packetizer. Oh, this is terrible. My writing is awful. Anyway, this is a packetizer. This does the same thing that the HD0 system does. It converts that stream of data, compressed data now, compressed video data, converts that into a stream of packets with headers and checksums and things. So it knows what it's working with and it can deal with errors and so forth. That then goes off to that exact same thing we saw before. The OFDM, the modulator, which creates the radio frequency. And then we have, an, again, a multi a radio frequency amplifier. And here is the video transmitter. So and there's a, a source of radio frequency here. So in that respect, we see one of the big differences between HD0 and DJI. It's this. It's the frame buffer, and it's the data compression, the video compression. And that explains why the DJI, one of the reasons why DJI has a higher latency than HD0. HD0 doesn't do anything except break this up into packets and squirt it out the end. So it's a very quick process. Building up a frame buffer takes time. You've got to collect all the data. So the buffer isn't ready until the last byte has gone into the buffer. Then you can start doing your compression, which means you've got to wait for a whole frame of video or maybe half a frame with DJI. I'm not sure. But you have to wait for a lot of data to be accumulated in the frame buffer before you can start compressing it and then sending it out. So these two boxes here add latency. And typically, that's 28 milliseconds to over 40 milliseconds of latency. So that's why the DJI system has latency, because it's actually compressing the data. But the upside of that is that the image from the DJI, to be totally honest, if you're looking at a, at a relatively still image, it is much sharper, it's much crisper, it's much clearer, it's a, it's a much higher quality image because it has been able to effectively get more detail from the picture by removing the redundant information. It really does look, I mean, anyone who says that the, the shark bite looks as good as DJI, they're not really telling the truth. It's I've yet to see a comparison that shows them as being total um, equivalents. The, the DJI gives you a better image most of the time. There are times when it doesn't. I'm going to cover those shortly. Um, so that's the transmission side of things, and that's fairly straightforward. Over here, we'll have the receiver, um, as we did before. I'm going to draw a little dotted line here again. So this is the video transmitter. This is the video receiver. Okay. And down here, we have an antenna. Actually, all these systems have multiple antennas, so we just treat it as one, though. And we have an RF amplifier to boost the signal, just like with HD0, as I mentioned. We have an OFDM. This is a demodulator, remember this? So this takes the radio frequency and pulls out the packets that we had before. And here is the depacketizer. So here we have a bit stream. Sorry, we have a packet stream. This is where our packets come. They go through the depacketizer and they come out as a bitstream without all that header information and the, the checksums and things. That goes, and this uh, this goes now into a video decompressor. Video decompressor. That goes into another frame buffer. So you can see all these things are sort of complementary. Each block here is undone at the other end. So if we look at it, we've got RF here. And we've got RF here. We've got a packet stream here, and we have a packet stream here. We have a bit stream here, and we have a bit stream there. We have video compression here, decompression there. Frame buffer from the camera here. Frame buffer is rebuilt by the system. It's rebuilt, and then it goes off to the 
DJI goggles and it shows up on your face. All right. That's how it works. So these, these bits just do and undo everything. I'd better put a little oscillator in here for the OFDM. Anyway, so you think, well, that's pretty good. That's, that's the only real difference is this compression, right? Well, no, it's not actually. The DJI system is even more complex than this because whereas the HD0 system is just like analog, the video transmitter only sends and the video receiver only receives, DJI is a bi-directional system. It's a two-way system. That's why your goggles in the DJI system actually transmit. There's a, there's a link that goes back from the receiver to the transmitter, and you might think, well, why would you do that? Why would you want to link backwards? Well, it's pretty straightforward. Um, what it means is that we can actually, whereas with the HD0 system, if you get a packet of this data and it gets corrupted, oh no, that, that data is corrupted, what do I do? The, the HD0 system ignores that data and it puts a little speckle on the screen. It says, I can't use it, put a speckle on the screen. That's why the HD0 system breaks up with all those little speckles that we, we saw earlier. It's because if a packet is corrupted, it just can't put anything there. So it puts, just looks like random color to me, but puts can't put any image there. So you end up with a, a glitch in the video image, right? Now, with DJI, you don't get that. When the DJI image breaks up, it doesn't break up. The latency goes up and it gets pixelated. It starts getting blocky, but you don't actually lose individual, you don't actually get individual blocks of the image disappearing as such. And the reason for that is that down here, where we have our, our depacketizer, this piece here, this thing is smart enough to know when it's lost a packet. And if it loses a packet, there's, a, there's some smarts here. I'll call them smarts. It reports to the smarts and says, I've lost a packet. And the smarts is connected to a video tra or a transmitter, a data transmitter with an antenna, right? Over here, we have a, another receiver. Remember, this is a video transmitter, but there's an antenna. Well, it connects up to the main antenna. There is a receiver and some more smarts. And that's connected to the packetizer. So let's say this packet, let's say there was a packet number seven or whatever, it gets lost. It gets hit by interference at this end. Once it comes down here and the depacketizer tries to um, recover packet seven, it says, oh, that's an invalid packet. The, the, check, the, the error checksum doesn't match. The data in it is not valid. What it does is it doesn't put a speckle on the screen. It says, oh, smarts, tell the other end to send that packet again. So this sends a signal out here. It's received. This end, the smart says, oh, Oh, we need to resend packet seven. So it resends packet seven. So instead of getting a speckle, chances are the next time it, packet seven arrives, it will be able to be used because the data won't be hit. And because we're building up a frame buffer, it doesn't matter even if packet seven arrives after packet packet eight because it, the, the packets all fit into the little frame buffer. It can put it in the right place. It can rebuild the frame one screen at a time. And therefore you get a send and, send and acknowledge. So basically this can correct errors by having them resend. That, at least that's the way it appears to work. So that means you get a much more resilient image. The, the DJI system doesn't get speckly. It doesn't break up in the way that HD0 does. But this does require a bi-directional connection. The video transmitter also listens, and the video receiver also transmits. But it goes even more than this, because this smarts isn't just connected to the packetizer. It's actually connected down here to the video compressor. And down here, it's also connected, or it doesn't have to be connected to the decompressor because it knows how much compression. But if we get a whole lot of these packets getting lost, it means obviously the signal's very low. We're, we're running out of signal strength. We're losing a lot of data. What do we do? We could keep resending, but eventually you can't resend enough. There's too many resends and you end up with problems. So the smarts um, says, if we're getting um, too many packet losses here, it talks back here, and this smarts says, oh, we need to increase the video compression and send the data more slowly. So if you increase the compression, you get less data coming out, which means you can send that data at a lower rate. And in the case of OFDM, what you can do is you can use fewer of those carriers because you're not carrying as much information, which means you're less likely to get hit by interference. It also means that you get more signal strength received at the other end. General rule of thumb with digital systems is the slower you send the data, the more range you have. 
And it's a bit like the analogy to that is if you're standing in a, in a room at a party and there's some really loud music and you want to talk to somebody, if you talk quickly, they can't hear you. But if you slow down and talk very slowly, pausing on each syllable, then it's much easier to understand the person. That's how digital RF comms works. If you slow down the rate at which the data is sent, the receiver has more time to make sense of it at the other end, so you'll actually be able to hear it from further away. So what happens here is when it starts losing an unreasonable number of packets, the video receiver, your goggles, sends a signal back to the air unit and says, oh, can you please slow down the data? Can you compress it more and slow it down? And that's why we get focus mode. You see in the DJI system along the edge of the goggles, you'll start to see the image starts getting blocky and there's lower resolution because it's slowed down. It's compressed that data more and sending it more slowly. And then the overall picture as a whole, when we get to the limits of range, that happens to the entire picture. We actually send, we compress stuff really, really heavily and send it really, really slowly. Slowly, but it still gets through until you reach right to the end of range. It's quite amazing how that works. So this is what we call, it is an adaptive system. It has an adaptive bit rate. Adaptive bit rate. And that's why the latency varies. That's why it goes from 28 to 40 plus milliseconds. Because the more compression you have to do, the longer it takes. And it reaches a point where even though you've compressed it heavily, it's still going to take longer to send it because you're sending it more slowly. So the, the latency goes up. So that's why the DJI system can give a really, really impressive picture and it gets very little in the way of breakup. Um, but the latency will go up and down depending on how hard this compressor is working, how many packets are resent, and how many carriers the OFDM is using. It's, it's a really clever, clever system. Um, uses all the digital tricks to try and get the best out of the hardware. But I said earlier that the DJI system gives a superior image, but not always. Not well, Sometimes HD0 gives a much better picture. And you might think, how can that be? Well, I'll tell you why. One of the things with compression is that you remove small details. The more compression is applied, the more the small details are lost. It basically, it smooths over the details. It says you don't need to know how many blades of grass there are. You just need to know that the, the grass is there. And so when you've got a lot of movement or a lot of detail like leaves in autumn in the DJI system, they tend to blur. You notice if you're traveling low at speed, the, gr the ground gets quite blurry if you're flying over gravel or something. It's blurry because there's just not enough um, data. It's, you're losing too much in the compression. And so you, you lose that and you, you start losing. If you're flying through dappled light and trees in a forest and stuff, even if you've got strong video signal, you can still get a really kind of blocky pixelated image because the compression can't keep up. And that's when the HD0 really shines, because HD0, it doesn't do any compression. So you get the same quality of image on a very plain scene as you get on a really hard scene, like um, rippled water or dappled leaves or anything like that. The quality of the image does not change based on the amount of detail in the image. And that can be quite handy if you're racing. If you're racing, you want to see the detail at speed. With DJI, the faster you go, the less detail you're going to see, because the more change there is, in the picture between each frame. So yeah, again, what is the strength of DJI it can also be a weakness depending on the application. So this is why I'm hoping this information will help you make decisions. So obviously if you want ultimately low latency and a consistently sharp picture, not necessarily the sharpest picture, but a consistent sharpness to the picture, then HD0 will deliver that. But if you want an image that is going to be really better until you get a lot of movement or until you get a lot of picture detail and you want to be able to get away from breakup as produced by the HD0 system, you want just the best possible experience right up to the point that the video link fails, then DJI is your choice. Uh, but you can see DJI vastly more complex and which is why DJI systems are also more expensive. Um, because all this extra circuitry in here, it consumes power, it costs money um, and it has a size and weight penalty associated with it. So yeah, there you go. That's, that's the DJI system, far more complicated than HD0. And it has its strengths and it has its weaknesses. So there you go. I hope you're still alive. I hope you're still kicking. I hope you're still breathing. Have you woken up yet? <laughs> but that was it. Unfortunately, it was long. It was long-winded. I could have done better, but I've tried to do this video a number of times and this is the best I can do. But uh, hopefully you've learned enough from this video to now make an informed choice if you go out there and decide to go digital. And uh, the bottom line is it's all good. The bottom line is it's all good. Every FPV, um, whether it's HD0, whether it's DJI, whether it's good old analog, it's all good. I enjoy every type of FPV and I'm sure you would too. So be aware that you can't really make a wrong decision.
because if you buy something and you decide later to buy something else, you've still had a snot load of fun in the meantime. So just take the plunge, go for it. And uh, as I say, hopefully the information in this video has been enough to give you the, the ability to make an informed decision. So you're gonna buy the system that may be best for you. As I say, you're the only person that matters here. I don't count, no one else counts, just you. And with that, oh, our tell a lie. The people who count here are my Patreon supporters. Always gotta have a plug for my Patreon supporters because that's all you get if you sign up to my Patreon. You don't get stickers, you don't get special release videos, you get nothing. Just warm fuzzy feelings because you are making it possible for me to make these videos that don't earn me a cent from affiliate links or sponsorship or anything else. And there were no mid-rolls in this video. I always gotta say, there's no mid-rolls in my videos because you deserve uninterrupted viewing because my Patreon supporters make it possible. Anyway, that's it. Thank you for watching. Go down to the commenty bit if you've got something to say or a question to ask. I'll do my best to address either. In the meantime, thanks for watching. Bye for now.